Hello, everybody. My name is Oliver Lash, and I'm the author of the textbook Principles of Management, Practicing Ethics, Responsibility, and Sustainability. And this very short lecture is on uh, the question, how can we rethink financial management in order to make it more ethical, responsible, and sustainable? And uh, before I go and, uh, and, and share my presentation, I would actually like to point over here. You might see this, uh, uh, this image back here. Uh, some, of who, some of you might be Banksy fans and recognize that it's one of the, uh, the more uh, the street art that Banksy has, uh, the artist Banksy has done, um, which actually is really good as a theme or setting the stage for, for the session because it is about, you see that whip up there. So uh, this whip is a, a kind of a, a growth graph. So how your financial, uh, your revenues have been growing or your, uh, your profits have been growing or, or, or whatever other financial measure you might want to think of and how that, those financial measures then are very often used as a whip in order to force people to do something or to not do something. Um, and I've got another interesting Banksy actually hanging in my uh, in my office, which uh, uh, is a, a typical stereo, a stereotypical manager, and he carries a sign saying um, "No interest in people." So obviously, there's the double meaning of "I'm not interested in people." People don't matter to me as a manager, but also the point that well, it's hard to make a profit. Uh, by caring about people. So I, I, I think that really sets the stage because both of those uh, imply a need to rethink management. Um, so let's look at what um, we can actually, uh, under, what, what else we can understand about that and how we can possibly do that. So um, uh, here, this is the book I just mentioned before, and this is uh, a couple of slides from the financial management book, which is the very last book of the, uh, uh, the, the last chapter of the book. Um, and I think it's a really, really good idea to start with that kind of quote here from uh, Ed Freeman, um, the person who started the idea of stakeholders or stakeholder-based management. And uh, when I had an interview with him a couple of years ago, he said, well, money is important. Uh, I have got, I've got to make red blood cells to live, but the purpose of my life is not to make red blood cells. Uh, and business has to make profit to live. But making profit is not the purpose of business. So it says, yeah, well, of course, financial measures, money is important and uh, not at the very least in order to survive in the end of the day. Um, but even if you are surviving, it doesn't really matter if what you're surviving for, the purpose and your impact as a business is actually not good. So maybe you should actually die as a business if you're not doing, doing good things with what it is. So um, money always should be a purpose for something else, but that sounds a little bit lofty. It sounds a little bit crazy almost uh, and very far removed from business reality and managerial realities. But um, there are actually examples of where exactly this happens. So one example I would like to give you is uh, Mondragon Corporation, uh, a cooperative, which um, is a different form of a different corporate form, which is most of the times characterized by them being members led. Um, so members led means who are members actually. So members often are customers, uh, they might be employees, but also there's the idea of community cooperatives where members of the community where the, the business is located um, are the ones who hold shares. So automatically, the ones holding shares, financial shares of the, uh, of the cooperative are the ones who also make decisions because they have to be asked as owners of the cooperative them, uh, themselves. So you make the stakeholders who you're meant to care about, the decision makers about uh, of, of what you should do as an organization. And this is a really good, uh, uh, interesting financial measure where you can do exactly this. And they actually claim that they do exactly what Ed Freeman suggested there, that um, there's a subordinate nature of capital, of money. So you need money in order to serve the community, to serve your employees, in order to serve your customers. Um, but it comes a second thought. You need it, but it's not, a, uh, it's, it's not your, your primary concern. It's the, your secondary concern after you decided how you can actually serve your stakeholders. Um, so on, here's a couple of more examples of how we could rethink uh, financial management. And uh, this is related to, uh, you might have heard about the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was really, really strong a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the whole basis, the foundation of the, this movement was to say, particularly after the, the financial crisis in 2007, which very much was, was caused by financial management and in particular the financial sector, um, to say, well, basically the, the underlying problem is greed. 
So um, always wanting more, always wanting to grow bigger, always wanting to have more revenues, always wanting to be more profitable, always wanting to have more consumption automatically, always wanting to grow market size, always wanting to grow economies even. It doesn't work. Those are all um, measures or, 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 or goals that come out of the underlying logic of greed. We want to have more and more and more and more as opposed to having enough. Um, and uh, so what, what could we do? How could we reorganize financial management in order to not serve that kind of greed paradigm? Because unfortunately, that's a sustainability problem. We cannot always grow, grow, grow because the growth of our economy is restricted by the growth of our society and the growth of our society is restricted by the growth of the planet. We cannot have an endless amount of people living on that planet and those people cannot consume endlessly to keep fueling a growing economy. So there needs to be a certain limit and actually there needs to be degrowth. So we have to rethink financial management as well. So make it fit into a world where degrowth is the paradigm, not growth is the paradigm. And then here's another example. And this is um, a, a shareholder resolution, but in, you see it's Amazon over there. So usually we have shareholder resolutions about um, management uh, or parts of the business uh, not doing what the shareholders want in financial terms. So bad, uh, bad decisions uh, going to this or that market, investing into the wrong technology, uh, screwing up a product that was running well, um, or concerns about, about corporate governance as well, where you think, well, maybe the managers are actually managing their operation, uh, the, the corporation or the organization to their own benefit not to the stakeholders benefit, financial benefit most of the time. And this is interesting because in the, uh, the last couple of years, we very, very often have seen um, uh, shareholder resolutions. In this case, it's employee shareholder resolutions because apparently at Amazon, many employees are shareholders at the same time. And uh, this is about Amazon not being proactive enough about climate change. Imagine that, that's not a finance topic. Of course, there are, there's financial implications of you caring or not caring about climate change, but per se, it's not a finance topic. So uh, this is employees slash shareholders of the company saying, well, um, we are actually actively going against you and what you're doing because you're not acting upon what, uh, what's really important. This is our survival on this, uh, on this planet. Um, and uh, then another example, and this is more about the question, how do you invest in, and what, what do you invest in, how do you save? Um, usually we save money, right? Or we invest money into things. But here it's a little bit of a different thing. Um, this is about something called carbon insetting, and it's about investing in uh, or, or saving a different resource. And the different resource is carbon. And by saving carbon, um, in setting respectively absorbing carbon, in this case through the agricultural operations of Burberry, the, the big fashion brand, big UK based fashion brand. Um, by doing that, you're actually saving a different uh, uh, unit and you start accounting for a different unit, which is an environmental unit. So how, my, how many tons of carbon have you saved respectively uh, captured in this, in this case? So usually we save and capture financial resources. So once again, it's an interesting example of how you can, can rethink and use mechanisms that are primarily coming from financial management for non-financial uh, subjects like this one here, which is calm. Um, so overall, those examples serve to give us an idea about the different um, paradigms of financial management that we could rethink and how we could actually do that. So we already talked about how to rethink the profit paradigm, how to move away from continuously wanting more and more and more and more profit. And similar, a similar one is the growth paradigm as well. Um, but there's also others that we haven't really uh, had in those examples. So the short run paradigm, for instance, that um, we always have to report in quarterly results, maybe even quicker than that, which means long run thinking and taking long run decisions gets really important when your reporting reference is just three months in advance. So you cannot really care a lot if that's what you as a manager evaluated, measured upon in your own performance. If that's always only three months of three months away, not much longer, well, then, then you're in trouble. It's not going to work to think in long run terms as you have to for sustainability. The money paradigm as well, as we said, we've seen that in the, the Burberry carbon insetting example a little bit um, to say, well, we can actually move away from, from money as the primary measure. We can use financial management instruments 
uh, in order to manage non-financial resources as well. It doesn't always have to be financial resources we're managing with those powerful tools. Uh, the shareholder paradigm, well, we've seen a couple of examples where uh, it was not the traditional shareholders, but actually um, owners that are also uh, shareholders in other, other ways. So employees, community, and, uh, um, and customers in, in particular. Um, but also we could even move away entirely from the shareholder paradigm and say, well, um, as, as uh, uh, David Chandler, for instance, says, who, who wrote the book Strategic CSR, the textbook Strategic CSR, he is uh, uh, making a very convincing argument that this whole shareholder paradigm and shareholder value-based management, it is accepted as what we have to do. But if you look into legislation, for instance, it is not what you have to do. It is not that you have to maximize profits for your shareholders if you look in, into the legal foundations. Um, as long as you don't don't uh, uh, kind of screw your shareholders, screw your 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 your, um, your owners over in a sense, and do something that's clearly against their interest entirely, well, there's a lot of leeway in how you manage the corporation or manage any other organization. And then the internal in internality paradigm that whatever positive effect uh, has to be internalized for the organization, so it has to be profit that I get um, in the organization. Well, there could actually be um, for instance, a social return on investment, so not your internal, your own return investment internally, but a social return investment towards the outside, where you start thinking, okay, well, I'm actually not even winning when I'm doing this financially or in other types of benefits, but still is legitimate to do certain things because of the social external return on investment. Good. And the idea is then that, that all of those paradigms, they, they run through all of the different practices of, of financial management and very prominent practices are, of course, financing. Where do you put your money and how do you, uh, 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 sorry, how, how do you obtain the resources for what you're doing? Investing then, where do you put your money and for what reason in order to make what kind of revenue or what kind of value with it and distributing. Um, so once I actually have made a certain gain, who gets the benefits of that? And the idea is that overall, then we build something we could call good equity. So uh, sustainable, responsible and ethical equity that comes out of a, and not only financial equity that comes out of that transformed financial management process. And I wanna make, make clear, I, I'm not saying we should move away from financial monetary management. I'm saying it needs to be counterbalanced by all of the other things that financial management can do or that the tools of financial management can do. Um, so of course, that's a very, very short summary and, and, and more a little bit of food for thought I wanted to give you for your much longer lecture at the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, uh, China taught by, by Peter Hofmann. Um, but one thing that's really interesting is actually that uh, this case, which you can look at in, in, uh, 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 towards the end of that chapter, is actually somebody who was sitting in your very same class about three years or four years ago when I was uh, still involved in teaching it. And uh, this real case is anonymized, of course, so we wouldn't know who exactly it is, uh, is, is exactly about this. Um, how do we navigate those tensions between in financial management, between um, the financial factors and the typical tools that might often be problematic and the assumptions that might be problematic and some kind of social benefit of it. Uh, and there's much, much more in, in the book and, and have a closer look if you want to, for instance, you can use this one to calculate a social return on investment. There's a uh, kind of very hands-on description of how you do that in the, in the book as well. And of course, it's a much, much bigger topic. So we only have looked at a very small and very initial part of it, which is rethinking the assumptions of it. Um, have a closer look at the book. Um, this is the full reference and uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to receiving your comments. Um, uh, please do feel free to comment on that uh, on that video because unfortunately, because of the time difference, I cannot uh, be in your, your class live for the discussion, um, but we do have, have the opportunity to discuss uh, asynchronous here if you just put your comments into YouTube or uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn as well and, and get in touch there and in other, any other way that you can possibly think of. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the discussion.